ceiling in here is also commissioned. This was made by artists in Morocco, in Rabat, Morocco. Also, some of the architectural designs, like the spandrels, the, the design above the doorway, the archway there, the frieze work, that design you see in plaster all the way around. These were made here, but using molds the, that came from the workshop in Morocco. So the Moroccan workshop made a series of design molds that then were used throughout the estate. As you walk this way, these tiles over here, these are from a church in Spain. Again, another great example of, of quote-unquote Islamic art that's actually not from um, a Muslim setting. This is a Spanish marble fireplace, which actually has a crusader symbol here at the bottom. And then above it, we have this uh, coat of arms from the Ottomans, the Ottoman Empire. And as you start to head this way, um, look into this area, you'll see that these tiles that we have back here, the way that they glow, have this sort of golden appearance. These are the most significant tiles that we have in our collection. And uh, once we get everyone here, I'll tell you more about these tiles. Can I ask a question? Yes. So I understand, you know, you can't just straight away say this is Islamic art, but there are influences from Islam, right? So it could be from the church, but it's still influences from Islam. Yeah, of course. Cool. So it's that, you know, it's visual culture. Yeah. So there's different elements, religions, groups of people, yeah. cultures. You know, like a place like Damascus. We have interiors from Damascus. Oh, yeah. You know, that's the oldest continuously inhabited city in the world. Like right. thousands of years people yeah. have lived there. So so much of that mixed yeah. iconography. Yeah. Um, yeah. Sorry. No, I'm from India, and there's just so, so much. Right? right? So Hindu, the Rajput art, right. Islamic art. Right. It's all Yeah. yeah. Um, so I'm going to talk to you a little bit about these tiles. You folks can have a seat here if you want. These are the most significant tiles in our collection, and we say that because, one, they're definitely religious. They cut All of these tiles that you see here, this large mosaic panel, these tiles as well. Oh, okay. Um, they come from shrines in Iran. So this large mosaic panel here, this is a mihrab. And what a mihrab is, it's a prayer niche. The function of a mihrab is to indicate the direction of Mecca. So if you go in a mosque, and really this is what mosques were originally built for, in a way to orientate the worshiper in the proper direction. When you pray, you have to face um, the Qabla or, or Mecca. So this mihrab would indicate that, but it doesn't come from a mosque, it's from a shrine. And it's actually from the shrine of Imam Zadi Yahya, which is in a city called Baramin in Iran. And it was built in 1265. Now we know the date because it's actually written on it. At the very bottom panel, the center panel, has the name of the artist and also the date. So the name you know, basically says this mihrab is made by Ali bin Muhammad bin Abi Tahir. And we have a translation of that written up here so in the text. When you say shrine, that's mm -hmm. a Sufi shrine? It's a Shia shrine. Okay. Yeah, I'll tell you a little bit more about that. Um, the date that's written here is, is uh, 663. Uh, shop on 663. So it's roughly equivalent to May of 1265. So the type of shrine this comes from is known as an Imam Zadeh. Imam Zadeh is a title, but it's also a noun describing these shrines. What Imam Zadeh literally means is born from or descended from the Imams. So these are Shia specific shrines built for descendants of the Imams who are the family of the Prophet. And this is what Shias believe that religious and spiritual authority has to extend through the family's prophet, or the prophet's family, sorry. So the next in line, according to Shias, after the prophet was Imam Ali, who was the first Imam, and then his two sons, Imam Hassan, Imam Hussein, the second, third Imam. There's a lot of variety within Shiaism even, and, but a lot of Iranian Shias believe that there are 12 Imams that came after the prophet. They're known as 12 or Shias, and so there's shrines built for those 12 Imams, but then also, Almost every city, every town in Iran has uh, Imam Zadeh shrine built for a descendant of one of those 12 Imams. So Imam Zadeh Yahya was a descendant of the second Imam, Imam Hassan. Um, Doris Duke purchased these tiles in 1940. And she bought them from a very well-known art dealer, Hegak Kavorkian, who was an Armenian art dealer based in New York. One of the major art dealers that connected Western buyers to quote-unquote Islamic art. 
1940, she paid about $150,000 just for this mihrab because this was already a widely recognized and highly sought after piece. There's only six of these mihrabs that exist in the world that are intact. Four of them are still in Iran. They're in museums in Iran. One is in a museum in Berlin, and then this one is here. So in 1940, this was the only other one that was made available, basically, and put on the market. Um, in 1940, when she purchased this, you know, we don't really know a lot about Doris Duke's intentions, why she was attracted to Islamic art. She never wrote about herself. She never kept a diary or a journal. She was a very private person. But um, there are some sort of uh, exchanges between Doris Duke and Kevorkian, where initially Kevorkian is expressing hesitation in selling this to Doris Duke because she was a private collector. And they were having a conversation about the ethics of religious items in a private collection versus a public one. Um, they met in person. He agreed to sell it to her. He wrote back, after meeting you, I'm satisfied you understand its significance. You'll be a good caretaker of it. And I'm sure it probably didn't hurt that she outbid the other people who were bidding for it as well. But it's interesting to see this conversation about the ethics of this happening. So in 1940, when she purchased it, it was about 50 years after it had been removed from the shrine. And again, the story of the removal of these tiles from these spaces is really the sto story of uh, colonialism. It's the story of uh, archaeology and, and uh, um, you know, art collecting. And in Iran, it starts around 1840 when a lot of French, English, and German are going into Iran and quote unquote discovering this artwork. So once the discovery is made by the West, then there's a demand that's created. So collectors want these tiles from these shrines. Um, but who supplies that demand? That's again where it gets a little bit more nuanced because a lot of times it was Iranians, government officials, uh, caretakers of the shrines who would remove tiles and sell them. It did happen where foreigners would go in and remove tiles, but that, did, that was more on limited basis, like they would remove one or two tiles. To deconstruct an entire mihrab, this was definitely a, a, a well-planned out uh, construction project or deconstruction project, and it had to have taken a long time. So there was probably government approval for this to get this out of Iran. Um, but again, you know, we talk about the ethics of having these things. We feel a lot better about it being on public display as opposed to a private collection, which it was for about 60 years. And I started by telling you the function of a mehrab is to indicate the direction of Mecca. And this is not currently pointing in the proper direction. In Hawaii, um, it's actually northwest. So it's always the, the shortest distance. But the way that it's installed here, so Doris Duke knew what it was, brought it here, installed it in this space, which is sort of the prime exhibition space on the estate built on this east-west axis. So like when we are standing at the edge of the living room, or if you're standing on the lawn, these wooden doors actually open, and there's a large uh, glass uh, window that recedes into the floor. Um, so if you're out there looking in this direction, the way the mihrab is framed, it is paying it special consideration, but it's definitely out of context. And you know, the moment these things were removed from their original locations, they became out of context. Of the six that exist in the world today, this is the largest and most complete one. Um, four of them, like I said, are still in Iran. They're in museums in Iran. And they're actually not facing in the proper direction either. And there's one in a museum in Berlin who's, that's also misaligned. So again, as a museum, we feel that it's really important to highlight what this is, talk about where it comes from, the significance of these shrines and also the significance of the artists who created these tiles. You can tell these tiles are different than the other tiles in the museum. These are lusterware tiles. And it's a very delicate and special process to create them. There were a handful of families in Iran who had perfected this style of lusterware tile making in the 13th, 14th century. And they kept it closely guarded secrets only passed within the family. So there was three generations in this family, this artist. It's really rare to see tile work be signed. You never see that, but this is a really well-known artist from a really well-known family of artists. Again, three generations, a grandfather, a father, and a son. We don't know how they made this. Their techniques were, were secrets. So we don't know the chemistry of their glaze, the temperature of their fire. Um, we do understand sort of the process of lusterware tile making. People still make it. It's a double firing process. But we don't know exactly how they made this. And you can see the calligraphy throughout all this Calligraphy is, is uh, direct from the Quran. These are Quranic inscriptions. Um, and you see the different styles of calligraphy. You have the script flowing style of calligraphy. You have more of the block style lettering, the kufic, which you see around here. 
And then my favorite calligraphy on here is actually um, the one that's, that you're uh, filming right now. If you notice the archway that's built here, this is actually also calligraphy. The lettering starts at the bottom, it goes up, loops around, extends around here, and finishes at the bottom. And that's an example of floriated Kufic because it has the floral elements coming off the top of the script. I could probably talk about this for another like half an hour, but I'll save you guys that. <laughs> if you have any questions though, how do you know all this stuff? Um, just the studying and researching and, and you know understanding our collection for sure. Is there a specific um, history that, that interests you? Um, yeah, I mean, I'm from Iran originally, uh, myself, and just Iranian art, and, and really my interest is like uh, ancient Iranian art and, and like Sumerian, Akkadian um, culture and, and art, but um, a lot of that is what influenced what we have. Like actually the, the columns that are on this mihrab, these are very specific to Iran, and it, this is an attempt by the artist to want to sort of um, exert sort of Iranian identity on this mihrab because these columns are reminiscent of columns that you would find at Persepolis, which was the capital of the Persian Empire. You know, it's 1,500 years or so before the arrival of Islam. Can you please explain yeah. what is written over here? So this is all um, surahs from the Quran. Right, right. Yeah, right. yeah, same piece. So you see all the writing, the small writing as well. Um, and there's actually a few pieces missing. So these three pieces on the outside, or these four pieces are missing. And so these inside pieces are missing as well. But this is still the most complete mihrab left in the world from this period. One of six, you said. One of six, yeah. But the other six are missing more pieces, or the other five are missing more pieces than this. Yeah, you guys want to walk around a little bit? This is the former dining room. These doors are really beautiful. Some of my favorite um, pieces we have in the collection. They're from Iran as well. They're from the uh, 19th century. But a lot of the design and the influence of this, um, of the stories that are being told on here are older and they, they come from when the Mongols were in Iran, the Ilkhanate dynasty. And the influence they brought from East Asia. So you see a lot of East Asian influence in this. It's almost Chinese. Mm -hmm. The tiles back here, these are also made in Iran, a part of that replica. These are from the um, replicas of the mosque. And this is where you will see uh, some animal images as well, these peacocks. This was the former dining room. This is a French Baccarat chandelier that was actually made for a, a, a ruler in, in Hyderabad, in India, in the 1850s. Yeah, for the design. His name is here, actually, so... Sort of the way she had it, or is yeah, it? so she wanted to create sort of a tent caravan theme 
for the dining room. Um, and uh, previously, all of this fabric came down and covered all of the windows as well. So we pulled it up um, just to open this space a little bit more. But she lived here for six like years. Was like you could pull it aside, or it was all closed up? It was all closed up. And she had rugs and textiles and needles over it. I mean, it went through different iterations. So and over the 60 years, it might be that. Yeah. I think that was a more uh, later sort of renovation that she had. These uh, vessels here, these are actually part of an exhibition that we have ongoing right now, um, featuring Hawaii-based artists. So we have an exhibition called 8x8, where we bring in 16 Hawaii-based artists, eight visual artists, eight performing artists, to create new work. So these were made just a few months ago by Hawaii-based artist Janet Kelly. Um, and so every gallery that you go into will have a new ceramic piece that's a part of this exhibition. The visual artists this year were all ceramicists. The performing artists, we had a variety of different performers, like singers, poets, dancers, that did performances in our galleries. We captured that on video, and they're available on our website and YouTube page. And also we have a small gallery that has a TV that ha shows the performances that happened in here as well. So if you guys are ready, we can go out and look through the rest of the museum. And we have about a, a half hour or so Thank mm -hmm. you. 